As you probably know, the Sega Game Gear and Atari Lynx did not outsell the Game Boy despite having superior hardware. Better hardware does not mean a better console. But one company came up with a creative idea. Why not offer similar hardware at a lower price? Could this be the way of beating the Game Boy once and for all? Let's take a look. What's going on? It's Poger coming at you with another video. Alright, so if you've seen a couple of my videos and you like what I do, hit that subscribe button right there. We're really close to that 20,000 subscriber count, only a thousand away, so let's get there. And check out our Discord server, discord.poger.net. I'm also going to put a link right in the description. Anyway, let's talk about the supervision. To capitalize off the success of the Game Boy, Atari and Sega released their own handhelds. The Game Gear and Lynx might have beaten the Game Boy in the hardware department, but they didn't beat it anywhere else. Both consoles had a poor battery life, less than 5 hours, the library of games was mediocre, and they were too expensive. The Game Boy might have been more primitive, but it had more games and the battery life was much better at 30 hours. Neither console was able to overtake the Game Boy. So if better hardware isn't the answer, then what is? In the early 90s, the company Watara began development of their new console, the Supervision. They would show off a prototype of it at the 1992 Consumer Electronics Show. Later in 1992, Watara released the Supervision along with 18 launch titles. Their original design featured a rotating screen, but later on they released a model that closely resembled the Game Boy. Rather than Sega and Atari's strategy of using more powerful hardware, Watara decided to mimic the specifications of the Game Boy. Both consoles contained a processor running at 4 MHz. The screen size is similar, although the supervision was slightly larger. Both units only supported 4 shades of grey. It seems like the supervision is mostly just a copycat, so why would anyone buy this over the Game Boy? Well, the price. The supervision was only $50 compared to the Game Boy, which was $90. That was Watara's strategy all along, to build a console that was exactly like the Game Boy, but more affordable. Why buy the more expensive console when you can get the exact same thing for less? The Supervision initially had some popularity. It was featured as a prize in numerous game shows like Legend of the Hidden Temple and Masters of the Maze. The lower price point also did attract some consumers. You may want to compare this to the Mega Duck, which I talked about in my last video, but there are some differences. The Mega Duck was a very obscure console that was not released in many areas. The US didn't even get it. It's unclear what market the Mega Duck was for, but it was most likely supposed to be a knockoff rather than a competitor. The Supervision, however, did have a target audience, price-oriented consumers. Let's talk about the games. The console did have more third-party support than the Mega Duck, with five developers being involved. Sachin once again made a decent number of games for the Supervision. They actually seemed to care more about this console because they ported over some of their NES games like Pyramid and Galactic Crusader. The manufacturer of the Supervision, Watara, actually developed a handful of games, not just one. Speaking of games, let's take a look at a bunch. Let's talk about the pack-in game, Crystball. It's a basic Arkanoid clone where you make the tiles disappear and you must keep the ball from hitting the bottom. The console doesn't have analog controls, so it doesn't play super well, but it's an okay game. Here's Penguin's Hideout. You play as a penguin, obviously, and you must move all the diamonds to the arrow on the right. You can throw boulders and walls to kill enemies. The controls are not great. You can pick up diamonds, but they follow behind you rather than in front. So when you let go, you have to walk to the other side of it to push it to the destination. You should just be able to grab the diamonds and drop them in front of you. You can also trap yourself by throwing an unbreakable wall into the arrow. There's no way to get rid of it either outside of dying. Speaking of which, there's actually a die button on the pause screen. That's pretty funny. This is playable, but the bad controls make it a rough time. We're gonna play a few shooters. Galactic Crusader is a top-down shooter with weapon upgrades. This would be okay if the flickering wasn't so bad. I mean, look at this. This is terrible. This game was also on the NES, and it doesn't have that flickering problem. This is the one that I recommend. Tazak 2010 isn't much better. Here, you play a very short stage and then fight a boss. There's only two weapons in the game, and the hit detection is terrible. Most of my bullets fly right through the enemies. You also start off way too slow. There are speed upgrades though. 
Sachin also released this game on the NES and it's way better. There's more weapon upgrades and the hit detection is more accurate. This game does get repetitive, but it's one of Sachin's better NES games. Galaxy Fighter would correct all the mistakes from the previous two games. Here, there's more than two weapon upgrades and there's far less flickering. This game actually plays very well and this is the best shooter I've came across for the supervision. Here's Pac-Boy and Mouse. That's a weird name. You play as Pac-Boy and you must crush all the mice by pushing blocks into them. If you take too long, the mice will be able to eat the walls. The movement of your character is not fluent at all and it feels like I'm playing this on a Tiger handheld console. It's also hard to kill the mice using blocks because their AI patterns are so unpredictable. This is an alright game though. Let's take a look at Hash Block. At first I thought this was a Columns clone, but it's actually different. Here you have to line up four of the same pieces in a row rather than three, and you can actually turn the pieces horizontally. So it's a unique take on Columns, but it's extremely difficult to line up four pieces in a row. It's not like Poyo Poyo where they just have to be touching. In this game, they have to be lined up in a row horizontally, vertically, or diagonally. It's a decent game and worth it if you want a more challenging version of Columns. Speaking of puzzle games, Sachin brought over Pyramid. The rules are similar to Tetris where you must line up a straight row in order to make them disappear. However, unlike Tetris, the pieces are so oddball shaped it's very easy to leave gaps by accident. What made Tetris so fun is that the pieces could fit many different ways. You would be surprised at how many different ways the pieces can go together. But here, sometimes leaving gaps is inevitable, especially with the diamond pieces. There is literally nowhere for these things to go. This game was also on the NES and it's pretty much the exact same game. This is playable, but it's basically a poor man's Tetris. Here's Grand Prix. It's a typical racing game, but this is one of the worst I've seen. The game runs at like 2 frames a second and it seems like they achieved the 3D road movement using software. The music is absolutely terrible. There's also the game Eagle Plan, which is a flight simulator. It's ambitious that they tried to pull off a game like this, but once again the frame rate is poor and it feels like I'm playing this on an SG-1000. We'll take a look at a couple platformers now. Here's Jackie Lucky. Weird name. You play as, I assume, Jackie, and you must walk to the right to beat the stage. You can break blocks with your attack and you can collect upgrades that give you a projectile. The frame rate is terrible and Jackie seems to flicker a lot. You die in one hit and it's hard to destroy the enemies because your range is too short. This is a very sloppy title. Jackie is not lucky to be in this game. Hero Kid is an interesting one. You play as a boy who must walk to the right while keeping your energy bar at the top full. You have to collect fruit in order to keep it from going down. I'm surprised they tried to bring over Adventure Island to the platform. I wish they didn't. You can't control the direction of your jump midair and you have to hold the up button to perform a high jump. That's not how Adventure Island worked at all. And once again, the scrolling is very choppy. This is honestly the worst version of Adventure Island I've played, even worse than the SG-1000 version. There were some knockoff games that were made for the console. The game Blockbuster, interesting name, is a Tetris clone, but the playfield is slightly wider. Not surprising they tried to bring over one of the most successful Game Boy titles. A Balloon Fight clone was actually made for the supervision. It's like Nintendo's version, but you're able to hold in the button to fly rather than tap, which is nice. So what did they call this game? Balloon Fight. Alright then. <laughs> the game Honeybee is just Twin Bee with much choppier scrolling. I'm actually surprised they brought this game over, but I'm glad they did. To summarize the game list, we do see more ambition than we did on the Mega Duck. There's multiple genres on the supervision, like racing games, shooters, puzzle games, arcade style games, and more. However, the game library is still limited. The Supervision saw only 65 games, which is more than the Mega Duck at only 24 games, but still pales in comparison to the Game Boy which received over 1000 games. The quality of the games was also a problem. The poor frame rate and constant flickering of sprites was a continuous problem among many Supervision games. The console seemed to have a lot of trouble with scrolling. And for every game that this console had, the Game Boy always had something better. The Supervision would be only hurting more when the price of the Game Boy was dropped to only $60. This made the Game Boy only $10 more than the Supervision. At this point, with only a $10 difference, there's no reason to get the Supervision. There were some plans to release some movie games based on the Terminator and Rambo. Had they come out, maybe their brand awareness would have been enough to save the console, but unfortunately the Supervision would be discontinued before that ever happened.
Atari and Sega tried to beat the Game Boy by releasing more powerful handheld consoles, but it wasn't enough. The company Watara came up with a creative solution, offering similar hardware at a lower price. Unfortunately, the games were noticeably worse. There was a lot of flickering and poor frame rate among most of the games. A majority of the titles were also mediocre and low quality. The price drop of the Game Boy would only give consumers no reason to give the supervision a chance. Hey, I just wanted to thank you so much for watching this video. If you made it this far, hit that like button. If you enjoy this type of content, hit the subscribe button for more content. Both of these things really help the channel grow. If you have anything to share, feel free to leave a comment. I read every single comment on this channel, and I'm pretty good at replying back. Anyway, have a good one.